It's all over. We have judged God and we have condemned him to die. We don't want Jesus Christ with us any longer, for he exasperates us. We have no other ruler than Caesar, no other counsel than blood and gold. Crucify him if you like, but get rid of him. Get him out of here. Take him away, take him away. Since it can't be helped, let him be sacrificed and give us Barabbas. Pilate sits in judgment at the place called Gabbatha. Have you nothing to say? asks Pilate. And Jesus does not answer. I find no wrong in this man, declares Pilate. But let him die, since you insist. I give him to you. Behold the man. Here he is, a crown on his head and dressed in purple. One last time these eyes turn toward us, full of tears and blood. What can we do? There is no way to keep him with us any longer. As he was a scandal for the Jews, he is among us an absurdity. Besides, the sentence has been pronounced, lacking no detail in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And one sees the crowd clamor and the judge wash his hands.
They return his clothes and bring him the cross. God be with you, says Jesus, O cross that I have long desired. And you, Christian, watch and tremble. Oh, what a solemn moment in which Christ first accepts the eternal cross. O oh, day of consummation of the tree of knowledge, look, sinner, and see what your sin has led to. No more crosses without Christ, and no more crimes without a God upon them. Certainly man's misery is great, yet we have nothing to say. For God is now here, come not to explain, but to fulfill. Jesus receives the cross just as we take Holy Communion. As prophesied by Jeremiah, we give him wood for his bread. How long, how ungainly, how massive weighs the cross, how hard, how stiff, how heavy the burden of a useless sinner. How long to bear, step by step, until one dies upon it. Are you going to carry that all alone, Lord Jesus? Make me patient in turn with the wood you wish me to bear. For we must carry the cross before the cross carries us.
March on, victim and oppressors together. Everything shudders toward Calvary. God, led by the collar, suddenly falters and slumps to the earth. What do you say, Lord, of this first fall? Now that you know it, what do you think of this moment? When one falls, pushed away by the sway of an unbalanced load. How do you find it, this earth which you created? Not only is the righteous path harsh and rough, the evil path also proves treacherous and dizzying. It is not followed quickly and easily, for one must learn stone by stone, and the foot often slips, although the heart perseveres. O Lord, by these blessed knees, these two knees which together failed you, by the sudden nausea and fall at the beginning of the gruesome way, by the trap which succeeded, by the earth which you have known, save us from the first sin which one commits inadvertently.
O mothers who have watched a first and only child die, remember that last night beside the moaning little being, the water not taken, the ice and the thermometer, and death which comes little by little, no longer to be ignored. Put on his old shoes and change his clothes. Someone is coming who will take him away from me and put him in the ground. Farewell, my dear little one. Farewell, flesh of my flesh. The fourth station is Mary, who has accepted everything. Here on the street corner, she awaits the treasure of absolute poverty. There are no tears in her eyes. Her throat is dry. She says not a word and watches Jesus approach. She accepts. Once again, she accepts. Her outcry severely repressed in her firm, strict heart. She says not a word and watches Jesus Christ. The mother watches her son, the church, her redeemer. Her soul goes out to him as violently as the wail of a dying soldier. She stands before God and lays bare her soul. There is nothing in her heart which protests or draws back. Every fiber of her transfixed heart accepts and consents. And as God himself is there, she is also present. She accepts and watches this son she conceived in her womb. She says not a word and watches the saint of saints.
The moment comes when one simply cannot go on. That's where we fit in, and you allow that we be used also, perhaps coerced to carry your cross. As Simon of Cyrene, who is harnessed to this piece of wood, he grasps it firmly and walks behind Jesus, so that none of the cross may drag on the ground and be lost. All of the disciples have fled. Peter himself passionately denies all. A woman throws herself into the thick of insults, into the arms of death, finds Jesus, and holds his face in her hands. Teach us, Veronica, to defy human respect. For he who sees Christ not merely as a symbol, but as real, to others soon appears offensive and suspect. His way of life is inside out. His motives are no longer theirs. Something in him always seems to escape elsewhere. A mature man who says his rosary and impudently goes to confession, who abstains from meat on Friday and is seen among women at mass, is laughable and scandalous, amusing, but also irritating. He had better watch what he is doing, for others see him. He had better watch each step, for he serves as a sign. For each Christian shapes the actual, although unworthy, image of his Christ, and the face he shows bears the trivial reflection of the abominable and triumphant face of the God in his heart. Show it to us once again, Veronica.
and the cloth with which you comforted the holy countenance of the last sacrament. This veil of pious wool Veronica used to hide the face of the vintager on the day of his intoxication, so that his image might cling to it forever, an image made of his blood and tears and our spit. It is not the stones underfoot, nor the halter overstrained. It is the soul which suddenly fails. Oh, in the middle of our life, oh, the spontaneous fall, when the magnet no longer has a pole and faith no longer a heaven, because the road is long and the end distant. 
because one remains alone without any consolation. How slowly time passes, nurturing a secret hatred for the uncompromising injunction and for this wooden companion. This is why we stretch forth both arms at once, like someone swimming. No longer do we fall on our knees, but on our face. The body falls, it is true, and in the same moment the soul consents. Save us from the second fall, which one takes willfully and out of boredom. Before he ascends the mountain for the last time, Jesus raises his hand and turns toward the people following him. A few poor women in tears with their children in their arms. Let's not simply look, let's listen to Jesus, for he is there. It is not a man who raises his hand at the center of this pitiful illumination, it is God who for our salvation has suffered not only in paintings. 
Thus was this man, Almighty God. It is true then, there was a day when God truly did suffer for us. What is this danger from which we have been spared at such a price? Is man's salvation such a simple matter that the Son must tear himself away from the Father to attain it? If that is paradise, what is hell? What shall be done with dead wood if green wood is treated like this?
I have fallen again, and this time it's the end. I would like to get up again, but it's impossible, for I have been squeezed like a fruit, and the man on my shoulders weighs too much. I have done evil, and the man who died in me is too heavy. So let's die, for it is easier to lie down than to stand up, harder to live than to die, more difficult yet on the cross than beneath it. Save us from the third sin, that of despair. Nothing is lost so long as death has not been tasted. I have finished with this piece of wood, but the nails are yet to come. Jesus falls a third time, but he is at the top of Calvary.
Here is the barn floor where the grain of the holy wheat is ground. The father stands naked. The temple veil has been torn away. God is manhandled. The flesh of the flesh trembles. The universe attacked at its source shudders to its very core. Now that they have taken the tunic and seamless robe, we raise our eyes and dare to look at Jesus, pure and unadorned. They have left you nothing, Lord. They have taken everything, even the clothes which cling to the flesh. For today they pull off the monk's hood and the Blessed Virgin's veil. They have taken everything. There remains nothing for him to hide in. He stands totally defenseless and stark naked. He is delivered to mankind and revealed. What? That's your Jesus? He is ridiculous. He is beaten and covered with filth. He belongs with the psychiatrists and the police. Gross beasts have besieged me. Deliver me, Lord, from the mouth of the dog. He is not the Christ. He is not the Son of Man. He is not God. His teachings are false, and his Father is not in heaven. He's crazy. He's an imposter. Make him talk. Keep him quiet. And servant slaps him, and Renan kisses him. They took everything, but the scarlet blood remains. They took everything, but the open wound remains. God is hidden, but the man of sorrows remains. God is hidden, my weeping brother remains. From your humiliation, Lord, from your shame, take pity on the defeated, on the weak oppressed by the strong. From the horror of that last garment taken from you, take pity on all those who are mutilated, on the child operated on three times, encouraged by the doctor, and on the poor invalid whose bandages are changed, on the humiliated husband, on the son beside his dying mother, and on this terrifying love which must be torn from our heart.
Now God is no longer with us. He lies on the ground. The mob has taken him by the throat as dogs take a stag. So you did come. You are truly among us, Lord. You have been sat upon. Your heart has been knelt upon. This hand forced by the executioner is the right hand of the Almighty. The lamb has been tied by the feet. The omnipresent is bound. His high height and span have been marked on the cross. When he feels our nails, we'll watch his expression. Eternal Son, limited only by the bounds of infinity, marked here among us by that narrow space which you have coveted. Here in this body, Elijah stretches out in death. Here lies David's throne and Solomon's glory. Here is the bed of our cruel, powerful passion with you. It is difficult for God to assume our stature. They tug, and the half-dislocated body snaps and cries aloud. Drawn with the tension of a wine press, he is hideously quartered, so that the prophecy might be fulfilled that they have pierced my hands and feet, they have numbered each of my bones. You are captured, Lord, and can no longer escape. You are nailed on the cross, hand and foot, like a heretic or a lunatic, I seek nothing more from heaven. This God held by four nails is enough for me.
A moment ago he was suffering, it is true. But now he is going to die. The great cross sways faintly in the night to the pulse of God's breathing. Everything is ready. One can only leave the apparatus alone to inexhaustibly draw from the bond of man's double nature, from the hypostatic union of body and soul, all of his inherent potential for suffering. He is all alone, as Adam was alone in Eden. For three hours he remains alone and savors the wine, the unconquerable ignorance of man in the absence of God. Our guest grows weary, and his forehead slowly droops. He no longer sees his mother, and his father abandons him. He tastes the cup and death, which slowly poisons him. Have you not had enough of this bitter wine diluted with water to cause you to suddenly straighten up and cry, I thirst? Are you thirsty, Lord? Are you talking to me? Do you still need me and my sins? Am I needed so that all may be consummated?
Here the passion ends and the compassion continues. Christ is no longer on the cross. He is with Mary who has received him. As she accepted him in prophecy, she receives him consummated. Christ, who suffered before all, is again cradled at his mother's breast. The church forever embraces and watches over her beloved. That from God, that from the mother, and that which man has done, all of this is with her forever under her habit. She has taken him in. She sees, touches, prays, weeps, and admires. She is the winding sheet and the ointment, the sepulcher and the incense. She is the priest and the altar, the vase and the cenacle. Here ends the cross and begins the tabernacle.
the tomb where Christ is put, having suffered and died, the hole hastily unsealed so that he might spend his night there before the crucified revived and ascended to the Father. This is not merely a new tomb, it is my flesh. It is man, your creature more profound than the earth. Now that his heart is open and his hands are pierced, there is no cross among us on which his body will not fit. There is no sin in us to which his wound will not correspond. So come to us from the altar where you are hidden, Redeemer of the world. Lord, your creature is rent open, and how profound he is. 